Finally, we have um, Gerald Sassman, who's going to talk about uh, kind of how artificial intelligence, which we've heard of recently, maybe. I don't know if you've read something in the paper. And so, a, a kind of another take on what it means and what it could turn into and what it, how it relates to, to this. Hi. Um, welcome to my little lab in the top floor of my house in Arlington, Massachusetts, where I basically have ancient electronics and I build things uh, and have some fun. I wish I were there with you today. Uh, I've been into, I've been connected to the Lisp world for most of my life, actually. I learned Lisp uh, by at a Chinese restaurant dinner uh, from Bill Gosper when I was a freshman at MIT in 1964. I was working for Marvin Minsky is one of Minsky's hackers, and we would regularly go to dinner and do things like that. Anyway, Gosper showed me over on a piece of uh, paper napkin uh, the, the basic idea of the eval apply interpreter, and boy, was I hooked. Okay, that was uh, very important to me. The, uh, the artificial intelligence world and the Lisp world have been intimately connected forever, okay, and for a very good reason. This made certain things possible and practical. And the other way it goes is that the artificial intelligence world has stimulated list development enormously. So I'll get into this, but I just want to say I'm very happy to be there or we're all here, although I wish I were actually there with you. Um, so let me uh, switch to a to my uh, my screen here. I'll get there's the Share, I'm sharing my screen. I have to get it. Unfortunately, I hate mice. Okay, I've got it. Share. Yes. So what I want to talk to you about today is the idea of what's currently artificial intelligence because it's become very strange. It's a mixture of the old stuff that I'm used to, which is mostly symbolic computation, and newer stuff, which is, which is machine learning stuff, and I want to talk about that. And this is one of the things I don't understand very well. So I want to be very clear that I am not talking to you in a way of, of deep knowledge. I'm confused as, as much as everybody else. Okay. Certainly as much as I, and I really like being confused. One of the best things in the world is being confused because that's an opportunity to learn. Anyway, the artificial intelligence world has been very successful over a very long period of time. Okay. We've been able to... Uh, make machines that can do all sorts of wonderful things. We can make world champion chess programs. We can make Go programs these days, poker machines. We have wonderful symbolic manipulation these days. You know, when I was a freshman, it wasn't apparent that you could make a machine that could do symbolic integration well. And now uh, you can basically buy it from Mr. Wolfram, uh, for example, or you can just use his stuff, okay? And that's uh, that, of course, was mostly developed uh, over many, many years, uh, a good percentage of it by Joel Moses in the M MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. But we have things that can do, uh, do logical stuff, deduction, mathematical proofs of various kinds. And these days, more recently, because of the uh, huge amounts of data available and the, uh, the machines that are sufficiently powerful that they could run a neural network, we have uh, vision systems that seem to see pretty well. And uh, there's Hearing, there's things that can hear and speak. You know, you can use your, your a little assistant type devices, and they work pretty well. Uh, and so we have strange stuff. We have these these things like GPTX chatbots, which are um, remarkable. Okay, so it's not entirely clear whether they are the same kind of thing, and whether or not they're even related to the the more the more traditional symbolic type. Uh, systems that we've been dealing, dealing with over most of our development times. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure whether or not these things are, quote, intelligent, whatever that means. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to give you an example. Okay. Here's a, here, my friend Howie Schrobe, uh, my, my former student, I asked uh, some GPT machine, uh, tell me about the Schrobe Davis theorem in computational complexity. And it wrote several paragraphs. The first paragraph you see here, okay, that's the answer. And it wrote another two, 
and it wrote another one. And, you know, they're pretty coherent, these paragraphs. They make sense. Uh, this is certainly uh, passing the Turing test. Uh, there's only one thing wrong with this, and that is there was never such a theorem. How we never worked in computational complexity. This is an amazing bullshit artist. That's that's now, of course, maybe it takes a lot of intelligence to be a bullshit artist. Right? How they say to make good bullshit is pretty hard. Okay, so how does it work? How does something like this work? Well, it seems to have assimilated a huge amount of data from the network. Okay, things like all of Wikipedia and things like that. It sort of it does a lot of of, um, of scraping of the network and that sort of thing, uh, and uh, it basically trains up some enormous enormous function approximation machine implemented as some sort of neural net, which is, a, as far as I can tell, uh, a composition of, of very large functions with a very large number of parameters. <clears throat> and uh, using what the data it has, it employs uh, statistical methods to predict a continuation of the text that already is, is either received from the person and, and or the text that it's adding to it already to the, this long piece of this corpus of text, okay? And it's surprising that such a process produces locally coherent, maybe it's not surprising, locally coherent text that is perfectly grammatical, that's the hard part, but what's most surprising is that you get to the impression that there's semantic coherence here. Now that's pretty interesting because this is not at all the way humans work, okay? Here's a, a famous old Chomsky argument called the paucity of, of stimulus that explains something about, about the way humans work, which is quite different from the sort of thing that the uh, GPTs do. Okay. Every little child learns his native language in about three years. And if any astronomer knows that there's about pi times 10 to the seven seconds in a year, okay? So there's about in three years is 10 to the eight seconds. So on the average, no child learns more than one new utter utterance every minute. I mean, that's pretty amazing if that were actually happening. Most of the time, a uh, child's sleeping half the time, but also you're not talking to a child every minute, okay? So there's not, at most, 10 to the 6th utterances. Most of the utterances are redundant. They're the mother saying the same thing over and over again, over again. Many of them are noisy and not very grammatical. Yet by three years, a kid is basically pretty sophisticated in both language and common sense knowledge. Now that's that's interesting and very, 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 very surprising. And so we don't really understand how that works, of course, either. But by contrast, okay, you can see things like this, which say that it is no longer possible to fit the model parameters in the main memory of even the largest GPU. Okay. Just looking at this, training a GP3 model with 175 billion parameters. Okay, that means that that's the number of, of parameters you're trying to adjust by some gradient descent. Takes about 36 years on eight B on a giant machine, or seven months with that. Okay, it needs the energy of a small city. Okay, but the child runs at 100 watts. It's 20 watts to the brain. We know that. You you all know that really, right? That a uh, a human eats about 2,000 kilocalories a day, and let's see, uh, one one calorie, four, but it's 4.2 joules per calorie, so that's 8 million joules, and it's 86,400 seconds in a day, so that's 100 watts, and we know about a fifth of that going into running a brain. Okay, so this is already different. This is a very different kind of. Remember, that, uh, you know, between the, the the little kid and this this machine. Let me show you another thing that's interesting that's very hard to see how that could possibly be, be uh, the way the machines work. Um, I'm going to show you something that you'll never forget. Okay? This is, you're going to remember what I just showed, about to show you for the rest of your lives. As you see here is a WUG. Okay? You've never heard the word, word WUG before. I'm sure you've never heard the word WUG before, except for those of you who happen to have heard talks by me. And now there are two of them. Okay, everybody try to tell me if you're a native English speaker, is there, how do you say there are two? Come on, complete that. You just did. 
okay, I can't hear you. If you were in my classroom, I would hear you. But the answer is, there are two wugs with a Z, the way you say it, okay? So that means what you've done is not only did you learn about wugs and we'll never forget them in one one shot. There's no repetition needed, no uh, uh, no training, but also you immediately generalized to use a rule of English pluralization, which is that as a, a, the sound of a the end of the word is a voiced consonant like G, then the then the voicing continues into the pluralization S to become a Z. That's a particular rule of English grammar. It's not other languages. So that's a that's just showing you the kind of thing that we don't have the GPTs knowing how the large language models, for example, don't seem to, to learn this way. Okay, we don't really know how to make them learn this way right now. So the real problem here is what do we mean by intelligence? Okay. And of course, it's a very strange thing. There are lots of words like intelligence that apparently don't mean very much because they mean too many things at once. We have words like intelligence, consciousness, emotions, memory, and thinking and understanding. And Marvin Minsky always used to tell people, including certainly me, his, his students, that these are what you call suitcase words. What happens is that you put you put a lot of things you don't understand into a suitcase, okay, and they are bundled and they may be even unrelated with each other. And by golly, uh, you uh, you try to uh, try to use that to uh, to capture something that they have in common, even though they may not have anything in common. So to make progress, we have to unpack the suitcase and examine the various items in that bundle. Okay, so here's some unpacking. There's a large number of possibly unrelated mental abilities that are relevant here. Okay, we and there's many more than the ones I read running here. But you have to be able to, uh, to be intelligent. Intelligent thing has to focus attention on the salient features of the situation. It recognizes that a situation is, in, is similar to a previously one encountered one. It has to predict the consequences of taking an action in that situation or no action. It has to formulate a plan, if necessary, to uh, to deal with the situation, to be able to execute a plan, and then after the uh, after the the, the, the situation is gone, has to reflect on the success or failure of the plan so it can change its strategies based on reflection. And what matters is not, you know, is not any one of these things. It's the, uh, how, the question is, what, if some agent, we some, claim some agent is intelligent, we have to understand exactly what abilities it has and whether they are like these and whether there uh, is more. Now, there's a problem with what's going on here. Can any particular large language model, what do we know about that? There's many reasons we don't know. Okay? They are, the led large language models are monolithic. They're opaque. They have ridiculous numbers of uh, numerical parameters. They're trained on enormous data sets, and the training course is enormous, enormous in energy and computation. So there, therefore, we can't actually investigate them scientifically. Even the people who build them can't. Okay, the people like like uh, Google or something, because it costs so much to make and to test one that they can't sit there and try try a little bit of change this way, a little that way. The same normal way we deal with science when we we try to understand something, we have to perturb it, and we have to say how does it how does it change? We have to rebuild it. We have to rebuild it say thousands of times to make any progress in understanding what the thing is really doing. Okay. Now, there's a scientific thing that says that yes, indeed, it's possible to make a large language model or something like that that could do everything. So I want to be careful not to get out of the theoretical possibility here, you know, if we want to make any particular behavior we want, all we need is a big enough transition function, a state machine. We have a state machine with a state register, and the state register has to be very, very large, okay? Because that re that's, that's memory, the entire memory. And there's some transition function which we have to have tra trained to give us from the sensor inputs and the current state, 
a new state and and uh, and control of the effectors and the things that change the world okay. and of course that's a that that's that's we know that's true that the, any behavior you want can get that way unfortunately it's not apparent to me that uh it is feasible to get to make a monolithic machine like this okay that is trained end to end to cover all the possible behaviors that we call the behaviors of a human the intelligent behavior intelligence behaviors the fact is that there's a lot more than than just the uh just the verbal interaction that can't be very much of a brain anyway you know language was only invented by by nature and evolution uh less than less than 200,000 years ago we know that and our ancestors who were large apes uh we diverged from chimpanzees probably around eight million years ago but our ancestors large apes uh didn't have language until much more recently uh, so language is a can't be it can't is only a tiny amount of the information that that we have to in our in our brains we also have the ability to do all the other things like to see which is obviously very hard okay 20 percent of our brains is is visual uh we have we have he, he also hearing uh motor control all sorts of uh, things like that and that makes it so it, it means maybe that's not an easy way to do it as a monolithic thing but the more important the most important thing that bothers me is when making a machine that's monolithic we learn very little about human intelligence it's easy to make an intelligent machine really okay it's pretty simple okay to make an intelligent being it takes two people nine months and fifty thousand calories but we don't know how the child works either and one of the things that an engineer or scientist wants to do is under is to learn from the experiments understand how things work see what matters to me more than than just having smart machines i want us humans to become smarter and the way we become smarter is by learning things by doing this kind of scientific experiments So that's a that's a real challenge so what are the prospects and the impediments for making intelligent machines okay with understandable mechanisms and maybe we can learn something from the biology okay well there's a fundamental question is the human brain composed of highly specialized components each carrying out a specific aspect of human cognition or is it a general purpose device where each component participates in a large variety of cognitive processes now that's already a weird dichotomy okay it may not be either of those is quite true it might be both of them are true okay uh so i the fact that i broke it up into what and again Minsky would call a dumbbell theory is probably a wrong way to think okay but but it's but it certainly is is relevant to partly questioning this this problem okay and there's you know lots of people have done work these days trying to figure this out uh one of the most famous ones is by nancy canwisher okay who's done considerable work on the functional architecture of the mind nice paper down here you can read uh i think it's worth well, well worth reading but there 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 with functional mri which is oh i spelled that wrong there should be a c here Ooh, bad jerry anyway uh the functional mri uh we find that there are at least a few specific uh, aspects of cognition are implemented in brain regions that are already highly specialized for that process okay we have basic sensory and motor processes we know that but amazingly enough even things like the analysis of faces their particular places in the inferior temporal cortex uh, called the fusiform area there's a thing that actually knows a great deal about the faces faces of people and uh, does recognition of faces and in fact if you stimulate one of those places you know, a person in surgery might be stimulated have a stimulation of that place to see what's going on and the person reports that that they what they're seeing is this is faces that are distorted in interesting ways okay but also we know that there are things about bodies body parts uh visually presented words 
and even there are parts of the, of the brain that have been appear to be uh, specialized for things like thinking about another person's thoughts, about, about uh, um, theory of mind. So this is a this is a uh, something we know from neuroscience research and from behavioral science research. Well, that's all I'm saying here is so. This is of course a a weird picture that shows the very grand uh, size, shape of the brain. It's actually wrong. I got it out of Wikipedia. It's wrong because these two regions, Wernicke and Broca's Ber area, are generally on the left side of the brain, and we're looking at the brain on the right side. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's sort of interesting to see that they've made this error. But in any case, uh, they, it's, they were not, we're, uh, the evidence were not monolithic. And from, from, um, from more more cognitive studies, okay, the mind, which is the the what is the processes that are running on the brain, okay, are built on various modulars as modular in itself. Uh, again, we had a there's a rather famous uh, 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 psychologist by the name of Elizabeth Spelke, now at Harvard. She was originally at MIT. Both of both uh, Elizabeth Spelke and Nancy Kangas were at MIT at one point. Um, she uh, did lots of experiments on little children, on nearly on infants, okay? And she found that there's already a ton, almost as early as you could possibly measure, the, the, the little kids already have representations of objects, persons, and spatial relationships. For example, uh, by, by doing experiments where you see whether a baby continues to be interested in the scene, okay, when you do some operation on it, you can tell whether it's a, the, the scene is actually interesting, okay, and that's, a, and what interesting might mean is that it's cognitively uh, something that's, that's slightly understood. So, for example, if you have a, uh, a little sort of puppet stage, and you have a, a box on the stage, and you have a ball, and the ball starts moving slowly and goes behind the box, okay? And then, uh, the, and then the, the box is removed and the ball isn't there. The child, a little child, like maybe a couple of months old, uh, already recognizes something is weird. They stare at that, okay? Whereas if the thing, if when you remove the box, the, the ball is behind it, that doesn't bother them at all. Okay, they, they are not, uh, they, are, they, they, they consider that boring. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of research Miss Belke has done with lots and lots of these things and discovered that there's already these mental representations, possibly something like what Chomsky believes, you, there's a deep grammar that's somehow built in, which underlies all human language. But I don't know, I'm not trying to make, again, these are things I don't know anything about. I'm trying to, very hard to learn this stuff because it's bothering me that I don't understand what's going on here. Okay, so let's go. Okay, one problem we have, and a very serious problem, and this is a problem of programming now. Okay, is we we like write lots of of programs that do particular things. Okay, we have programs that can do symbolic algebra. We have programs that can do mathematical logic type things. We have programs that can do, do some amount of vision with, with the uh, neural net type devices. Uh, we have some programs that can do uh, can 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 do some amount of, of language as we can see now. Okay, but the problem is we don't have programs. We don't have ways of putting things together so that we can make programs. Not that can just do. Here's an example of uh, an image. Here I have a program that can. Whoops, how did I get there? And Okay, so here we have a, uh, a an idea of a program that can solve problems of type A, and another one that can solve problems of type B. We can, of course, make something that can solve problems of type A or type B, but that's not what's most interesting. What's interesting is we don't know how to make problems pro programs that can solve problems of type A and problems of type B, and problems that depend upon the skills required to to solve problems of type A and problems of type B, the skills for problems of type B, okay? That is something that combines the, the wisdom getting from of A and B to make a solution, 
Let me give an example of that just for fun. If we have a, we have programs that play good game games like chess. I'm not talking about the, the crazy world champions, but we have things that could do that. Okay, that's a that's complicated tree search generally. It's a heuristic tree search, okay, but it's just a tree search. Okay, we also have programs that could do some amount of theorem proving. That's also a tree search. Okay. Now, why is it that when, they, when you put those together, we're not using the skills of one to make the other and vice versa? Why are we not combining the two kinds of searches to make a, to, to make a more effective search algorithm that depend, uses some of the tricks that are involved in each of the, the, other, the, 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 the other problem solving technique? That's the kind of thing that we don't know how to do. Okay? We don't know how to make things. In fact, one, one image of, of intelligence that I think is plausible is that intelligence is something like a manifold. You know what a manifold is if you're a, a, a mathematician? It's a very, very large sort of space. It could be a curved space, of course. It could be really a four-dimensional four space-time manifold, but it could also be a, uh, you know, just a big surface okay, in, in three-dimensional space. And one of the things we say is we really don't understand this manifold globally because it could be, for example, something uh, something like a torus, or it could be just flat, or it could be some other shape. It could be a, th a thing with multiple holes, a multi-hole torus, okay? And you can't know that by just looking at the little, little, you know, tangent planes, okay, that are, that are, that cover, that don't completely cover it. Okay? However, so, but we may make these things that solve particular problems. We're making little tangent planes, in this tor in this this uh, this manifold, and to get a real image of this, we have to get enough coverage to put it together and see how see how the big picture arises. So, what are the possibilities for doing this? Well, I'm going to show you one idea. Okay, I had a student, uh, Jacob Beal, who wrote an amazing doc. Sorry, master's thesis in 2002. Do I have it here? Somewhere here. I could wave it in front of you, but I suppose I'm not going to. Oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. Okay, for those of you who might want to see it. Okay. okay generating, it's called generating communication systems through shared context. Okay. There it is. And what, what uh, he did is he he didn't, he didn't have a, a problem. These, these modules that solve Problems of type A and type B actually solve no problems at all. They're just trying to learn how to talk. Okay, there's some shared environment. There's a bunch of, of random scrambled wires connecting these two. Okay, and there's random scrambled wires coming from the uh, in shared environment, some of which go to A and some of which go to B. Okay, and the, some of which go to both. Okay, like this one splits and it goes to both A and B. Okay, and so the, so each one of these sees some of the shared environment, okay, and the, and the the other sees some of the shared environment, and the goal of his machine was to have a sort of learning module inside of A and inside B that learned how to uh, describe. They say A is sitting here learning how to describe what it's seeing to B, so and B learns how to listen to that. So that B can reproduce on the feature lines the particular picture or whatever that A is seeing, at least with respect to the the shared parts. Okay, that is what's happening. Is it's developing? With, it's actually it learns very very fast to do this. This is almost no no work. Okay, and, but it, and the details I don't want to talk about today. But basically, it's a mechanism for learning communication protocol. Of course, inside here. You could imagine that there's special thing that knows about, say, social interactions, and here's something that knows about about visual stuff. Okay, and the connection between these two would be some pieces of think of this as pieces of a brain that have to learn how to communicate when in infancy. Okay, by seeing particular shared parts of the environment. Ooh, what happened there? Uh, hold on. Okay, I'm back. Okay, something happened there. Okay. Um, so that's something that's something uh, that is so very interesting, and uh, you know I think that we can if we understand this better. You know this is something we have a problem in 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 programming all the time too. 
We have big pieces of system that can't talk to each other. And by golly, wouldn't it be nice to have learning modules whose job it was to produce communication protocols? Okay, so that there's no need to to uh, explicitly program those protocols. They get discovered. And we know this happens in little children just by some examples that, again, Spelke made some, showed some experiments where it's possible for uh, even a, a 12 to 14 year, m month old child has the problem that the visual system is not really connected to the, to the uh, very well connected to the, the uh, locomotion system, okay? And I'm not gonna explain, go through that experiment, but that shows that, that, shows that, that at that time, it's not yet fully, fully cooperating, parts are not fully cooperating with each other. Okay, so now, then there's another question about what we mean by, by conscious behavior. Okay, and you know, there's a, one of the problems we have with, with this question of, of, well, before I go into that, I just want to talk a little bit about whether or not there's some uh, real objection to thinking, of every, let me go back here, to thinking about everything as a plumbing problem. Okay, if you, you know, The real question is, how could it be the case that when combining systems, each knows nothing about the world, okay, but you combine lots of systems, that somehow you have a smarter overall system that appears to know something about the world, that is, an artificial general intelligence? Well, yes, maybe we may, may we be missing lots of things there that we don't know about, but this is already a real part of the problem. Philosophers have thought about this for a long time. David Hume pointed out that that... There's nothing other than sense data coming into us. Okay. So the missing element must be some sort of intrinsic capability. What could it be? What is the idea of a cat or a dog? It's probably not a built-in idea. It's been included by evolution because it contributes to reproductive success. I mean, that's how you get you get something built in. Because then how would you explain the origin of enormous numbers of similar ideas of things that don't exist in the real world, like unicorns or satyrs? Or other kinds of things, okay? Now, so it can't be something that's an adaption to the directly an adaption to the real world built in. We also know, of course, that uh, a combination of subsystems can have properties that a that an individual subsystem does not have. Water is wet, but neither hydrogen nor oxygen is wet. So I don't expect that any particular neuron knows what a dog is, but a large combination of them arranged in some nice particular pattern may very well know what it needs to be a dog. What do we really know about brains? That's an interesting question too. And I'm just gonna just check to see if that's what I'm looking here. Uh, we know very little. Brains seem to be made out of about 10 to the 11th neurons and 10 to the 11th glial cells. So there, and the neurons appear to be interconnected in some complex pattern that, and they interact by electrochemical processes at synapses. synapses. And they're about 10 to the 14th of synapses. One constraint we have on knowing how brain works is latency. A neuron takes about 10 milliseconds to respond to, uh, to a stimulus. If I were to ask you right now, what's your name? You would respond to me within about half a second. Okay. That's, about, that's about 50 neuron times. The depth of computation from the sensors in your ear to the speech effectors in your throat is about is no more than 50 levels of computation. That's already pretty remarkable. I mean, they remember that from a linguistics point of view, there's signal processing, there's phonology, uh, morpho word morphology, syntax, semantics, the problem solving, and then you go down the bottom the other way. Okay, so that's a that's very little very little time to do all that much work in 50 levels. Even worse, the reaction time of an automobile driver is about 100 milliseconds. That's only 10 neuron times from the eyeballs to the, the, foot, the, the brake pedal. It's not apparently, it's not obvious how that can work, but it does, although just barely. Another clue is the detailed wiring of the brain cannot be specified in the genome. There's just not enough bits in the genome. As I said, the genetic code of a human is about 3 billion base pairs, which is about one gigabyte of, of ROM. That's a very small piece of code 
that's required to build, specify and build a machine as complex as a human. It's also the instructions required to run the machine in detail, to repair injured parts, to fight off other similar machines that are either trying to eat it. And it's a very flexible code. Only a small change is required to make a rabbit rather than a person. I wish we knew how to program that way. One of the things we should learn is how to program so that we get things that are that flexible and that that dense. Okay. But clearly there's one thing we can determine. There's clearly not enough code in the genome to completely specify the detailed wiring of the brain. Because the detailed wiring cannot be genetically specified, okay, they, they again the parts may must out learn to communicate with each other, and that's what Beale's thesis was about. Okay. Um, I have to be very clear about that. So there's some sort of here's a place where AI AI research, which is often contributed to technology of programming, okay, perhaps maybe something inspired by this kind of thing to be used in in real systems programming. You might want to learn how to do that. But I want to get now to talk about a mystery called consciousness. Okay. If we unpack the suitcase word consciousness into parts, much of the mystery recedes. It's actually pretty simple. A conscious being is sensitive to its environment and to its internal state. It makes decisions and takes actions based on information from both of these sources. And it uses an internal model of its own behavior and experiences to determine the consequences of actions it may take on its internal state and thus make safe plans. We have already now programs that are pretty smart, but not very conscious. And we have conscious, we have a certain amount of consciousness too, okay, in, in machines. My laptop is pretty clearly conscious. It is very dumb. Okay. Notice it is aware and regulates its internal state. It's kind of it's continuously talking to its neighbors. That is, is jabbering away with stuff on the network right and right now talking to you. It listens to me typing on its keyboard and when touching its mouse, as you can see, it responds. And we can discuss its state. I can talk to it and ask it, how much memory do you have right now? Or how much memory is being used? What's the load average? And it can it can tell me things like that. And if something goes wrong, like, for example, the power D errors appear in memory, uh, it will complain. Or if its power is low, it will, 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 will oi, my, my power is low. Okay? But it really is pretty dumb. It hasn't got, it, it doesn't solve very complex problems. It's certainly not, it's not, planning for the future okay it's not thinking about how it can improve itself okay by by studying the ways certain things it tried in the past have failed to work okay so it's a pretty dumb piece of uh, machinery okay. on the other hand we have programs that are pretty smart but not very conscious symbolic mathematics programs are pretty smart they can do things that we consider extremely hairy like for example doing symbolic integration of algebraic expressions or solving of differential equations. Okay, we have uh, some differential equations. We have physics sim uh, simulations. I've written lots of them in my life as well as written lots of symbolic mathematics stuff. We have things that can explore mazes, many kinds of mazes like, for example, game trees. We have theorem provers and SAT solvers. Okay, any really good problem solving system needs to re reflect on its own behavior and make modifications to its strategies and tactics to improve performance. The smart programs are not very good at that right now. So that's a real problem too. So our AI systems are not very conscious. And I want to give a suggestion now of what we might do and to figure this out. And that's how it has to do with the plumbing. Okay? That's why I called this a plumbing problem. They don't currently record their experiences and reflect on salient aspects of their behaviors as they solve problems. A system to play a board game should record a partial trace of its behavior, summarize and abstract that trace, and reflect on its behavior. Some of them do these days, like AlphaGo did. Okay, but basically, not that's not the way we write our programs in general. Okay, a system that should construct simple proofs and logic systems should do the same thing. But more importantly, the combination of these two systems should discover ways their search strategies relate. They should be able to combine strategies to do a better job on problems that require both skills. That is the plumbing problem that we've been talking about. 
Okay. So what we need is to make our languages have built-in mechanisms for recording traces, summarizing and abstracting traces, and providing feedback for improvement. Whoops, another error, typo. Ugh. Okay, there should be a T at the end of the, of, of, right there. So we need stack, we need to make these mechanisms implicit rather than explicit. The same way we, in the old days, way back at the beginning when Fortran had no recursion, Okay, we invented stacks to make recursion implicit. Okay, that was that was one of the things that Algol and Lisp did at the beginning, and the very first thing that did that I suppose is IPL5. We needed garbage collection. We invented garbage collection to make storage allocation deallocation implicit. And for those of you who know that it, that about SICP, my book, uh, AMB makes backtracking implicit. But we don't build that yet into most languages, even Lisp. Although in Scheme, because we can we export uh, general continuations, okay, the underlying continuations, it is easy to implement AM, okay, in, in in as a as an as a user program in Scheme. This I feel is a is a major problem a challenge for computer language designers and implementers. That is to make things that have make this stuff implicit. Okay, so that we can in fact make make things of the Beal type that can actually can actually develop interfaces between big subsystems. So I would say we need new plumbing ideas. Now, just to make sure that none of you think I'm I'm being uh, a little bit parochial about this, I'm not worried about the difference between numerical methods versus symbolic technique, tech methods. That has nothing to do with anything as far as I'm concerned. My laptop has no symbols in it. Okay, It has just wires with electrical potentials. Symbols are the way we talk about what's going on. We design our laptop so that it is easy for us to use particular combinations of, of voltages on wires to make particular symbols. That's a particular thing. On the other hand, there is some problem with the current ways people, you know, make these these uh, large language models or neural net things and so on, they're restricting mechanisms to compositions of differentiable functions because they are doing their learning by backpropagation, and that seems to me to be an unnecessary ontological commitment. One thing we know is, for example, the number of fibers in 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 brain that are going going in one direction is equivalent to the number going in another. That is, there, the number of neurons going from the cochlea of your ear into the auditory cortex, actually through, probably through the thalamus, okay, I forgot, but they, that number go, going that way is smaller than the number going the other way from the, from the, from the brain to the, uh, to the cochlea. The control is going the other way. So that's not true of the eyes. It is true that once you get into the thalamus, however, which is where the eye, the uh, optic nerves terminate, they, um, uh, the number of neurons going into uh, deeper into the brain is equivalent to the number going the other way. There's every level there's feedback, and the feedback is local. And it's not the case that, that there's some giant backprop type thing which is trying to adjust all of the parameters at once. Okay, somehow it's happening by 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 a local feedback mechanisms, and we don't know how that how that's done. But that would work really well. And the other interesting thing there is humans have very you, one thing that tells you that can't write you can't be just some simple what's the right word here um, loss function that you're trying to minimize, because people have, for example, intransitive preferences. It's possible to prefer A to B and B to C and C to D and D to A. Okay. Because there are many dimensions of these prefer preferences. So, I think that's all I wanted to say, and I'm not going to unshare the screen. Okay, and I hope to take questions. I am uh, very happy to. Okay. Now, I don't know how to actually ma manipulate my uh, machine here to... Listen to your questions. Listen to your questions. Questions. Okay.
Okay. All right, so we're going to do right. live Q&A slightly, so slightly differently now. So when the on-site director says new question, give me a bit of a pause so I can set the stream to forward the question directly to Geralt and then ask your question. And then ask your question. Okay, new question. So, um, you, you define consciousness in a way that I wasn't expecting. So, um, you, uh, you, you define consciousness, you define consciousness in a way that I wasn't expecting. So, um, you, uh, you, you, you define consciousness, consciousness in a way that I wasn't expecting. I got that. I heard you, and now I'm hearing a bunch of echoes. No problem. Okay. Of course, I don't actually define consciousness because, again, consciousness is a suitcase word. What I'm really saying is that one aspect of consciousness, which is the the one that how do we how do we normally think of something as being being conscious? It is something that understands itself, can can discuss with somebody else. Its internal state. It can complain. Okay. It can. It can uh, uh, make plans about. One of the things it does is it checks that if it's going to take an action, what are the consequences of that action on itself? And the way it does that is by applying, by doing some prediction of the uh, of the action of, of how things change in the world and how that change in the world change it will affect it, and therefore it's using its internal model of itself to say, will that feel good? Okay, new question. You say that uh, programming languages need new plumbing. Don't, uh, I just heard myself like, uh, repeat it. Hmm. The ultimate uh, way to make new plumbing, namely macros. Is that a good answer to your question? All right, so we had a case of crossed wires there. We need to remember that we have about 10 to 15 seconds of delay to work with. So could you please ask your question again? Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, you say that programming languages need new plumbing, uh, but don't list lang like languages have the ultimate uh, plumbing builder, namely macros. Macros are a syntactic mechanism for building new syntactic structure. That's not quite what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something more, more powerful. Okay, The kind of plumbing I'm talking about is things like having invented garbage collection. Okay? That when we have systems which provide completely new features that make complicated things that we think of as doing very hard and like the storage allocation uh, making that making that implicit so we don't have to think about it anymore so in this case I would want systems that have built in things that are maintaining traces of behavior extracting salient features of those traces and then allowing some other program to abstract them that's an example Okay, new question. Um, do you think uh, that such a system would be like some something like a blackboard system, uh, where there are multiple uh, components that can communicate via the blackboard, and uh, so they can share uh, like uh, a representation? Um, yeah. That's a very good question, and I like it very much because it's something like that. However, it's not, there's one global blackboard. 
The right way to think about it, I think, is that you have many components that say I have component A, B, and C. There is a blackboard between A and B. There is a blackboard between uh, B and C. And there's a blackboard between A and C, maybe. Not only to always totally connected. Because a part that may not be very, may not be interested in another part's work. But the, the things that have stuff to do in common have particular blackboards where they discuss particular uh, aspects of what's going on. Okay, That makes some sense. And that's one of the reasons I have been doing a lot of work on propagator systems, because I'm thinking of that as being a way of, uh, of prototyping that kind of, of local blackboards. Okay, new question. Um, which of the smart programs, uh, in your opinion, should we connect by plumbing uh, so uh, we can move uh, in the direction of more cooperative and smarter programs? Well, I think it's very important that we do exa do things like what I said, where things like game playing can be combined with other kinds of searches. Okay. I think also we should worry about how to make things that can do vision uh, work well. Consider the problem of self-driving cars. Okay. That's a very important problem. And that's coming up in the world a lot. Okay, well, you know, a vision system may see lots of illusions. It should, it has to, because the world is noisy and complicated. You could see a vision system might, for example, observe that there's, um, gee, there's an elephant in the sky. We all have, uh, have things, uh, things like that happen to us. We see when we look at, uh, the sky, we see clouds in interesting uh, combinations and, and forms, and we, we perceive uh, things like elephants or whatever. But something else had better be watching that and saying, that doesn't make sense. You're not seeing, that's the sky, and an elephant is heavy and can't possibly be up, be up there. So that's the kind of, of combinations that are important. And I can imagine in a self-driving car, surely... You know, when driving along in a in a uh, uh, where there's a a wet road, there's a star storm going along, and supposing the car discovers that it sees a a mailbox in the middle of the road, well, that might be true. It might not be true. It would be. It couldn't be true if it was a, if the mailbox was if the, if this was an ordinary sunny day. But if it turns out it's, it's a heavy storm with lots and lots of wind, maybe a mailbox was actually popped out into the road. That kind of reasoning is the kind of thing I want to connect to that vision system so it actually understands what's going on and says, oh, yeah, maybe I better worry about this. Is that a good example? Okay, one more question. Uh, we have been talking about uh, breaching the limits of our uh, knowledge and building new tools and building new uh, technologies that uh, uh, will be intelligent, will be conscious. Uh, imagine that we we are able to achieve the so fabled uh, singularity. Isn't there ethical issues that we should be discussing today before we reach there? Uh, and what do you think would be uh, good topics to talk on that issue. Well, that's a humongously large question. <laughs> and I could talk about that for hours. 
okay? And I apparently don't have hours to talk about it. But I think the most important thing to realize is that all of the economic systems we currently have, both capitalists and communists and everything else you can think of, make one major mistake. The mistake is that the value of a person is the work the person does. Once you've made that mistake, inevitably, you end up with a, a bad situation. We have to value people for the, for the fact that people are have intrinsic value. Okay? <clears throat> and as a consequence, when everybody, when, if, we have, if we have achieved the singularity, which we will, that the, that the value of human work will de- decrease to zero. The cost of goods and services will also go to zero. Okay? Because the productivity per person becomes infinite. At that point, there's no, no required work for anyone to do. That's different from whether they, a person could do work as amusement. Okay? But imagine the a- ancient Rome. The ancient Roman citizens had pretty good lives. Of course, they had slaves that didn't have good lives. But if our, if our, our electronic servants do all the work for us, then we can have very good lives, enjoying ourselves, thinking and, and playing in the same way that the aristocrats of ancient Rome did. Now, that's, that's, a, law, so that's a, a big problem. But the problem with a big way to, to get to getting from here to there, from the case where we have uh, economic systems which are based on, the, on human labor, Okay. Even doing useless labor, like there is a lot of useless labor. Okay, a lot of it is a lot of it is is things like uh, manipulating papers. Okay, doing doing insurance type things or whatever. You pick all the all the things people do. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that has no purpose except to to compensate for a a world where there's where there's scarcity, which will uh, stop being stop happening. Once we have machines doing all the work, okay, then then we we have a when we go from a world of scarcity to a world where there is no scarcity, yet there's going to be a very different kind of situation. And transitioning from this society to that one is very very difficult. So I think that's the biggest problem. I'm not too worried about the machines taking over and getting us or anything like that. I'm worried mostly about bad people using smart machines to do bad things. Okay? Okay, one more question. Hi, so um, besides uh, getting to implement uh, AMB in other languages, which I believe is the rather simple part in all of the things you talked about. Uh, do you have any ideas in mind, for example, um, either extending the propagator model or getting it to do something really fancy, given the context of your talk? Oh yeah, I have a lot of ideas about that. The most important one would be, remember the propagator idea is not really, I mean, I d- demonstrated it in terms of things like little adders and multipliers and stuff like that, okay? But that's that's just because of the kinds of demonstrations I do because I'm in, inspired by electrical circuits. But the imagine that you have whole machines like x86s running very large processes and that there's a, the propagator model is just a mechanism for producing a... Um, uh, producing these little blackboards, okay, that are connecting between very large systems. They could be over some network, okay. Making a network interconnection like that is a is an important question. But also, I want there to be Beal type stuff in the uh, on the boundaries, the Beal type learning the machines 
on the boundaries between machines so that the the, the the protocols get established by in by by communication okay that and i'm actually have some students working on that kind of thing or i have i i have had students working on that sort of thing and i plan to have others I think we, I think this is the end of the questions. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for uh, putting up with my random, my r random thoughts on this matter that I know very little about. Have a nice day. Thank you.